great He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things
We are continuing our sermon series titled The Church That Changed the World. It is based on a study through the book of Acts, and today we are covering Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. And this text speaks to us today in such a timely and relevant way about how we should think and how we should uh, conduct ourselves as Christians in a world where animosity seems to be spreading as quickly as COVID-19. Our text is an important epilogue to the story we covered last week in Acts 10, and so let me recap briefly that story. God gave a vision to a Roman soldier named Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, In the vision, an angel of God directed Cornelius to summon the apostle Peter. Immediately following Cornelius' vision, God gave Peter a vision as well, directing Peter to go to Cornelius to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, this was a momentous event because previously Gentiles were considered by most Jews to be so unclean, so unholy, so unfit that they didn't want to have anything to do with them, much less offer them the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus. Back in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Peter explains to Cornelius and his family The profound transformation in his own thinking stemming from the vision. Peter starts with the the cultural norm he was operating under before the vision. He says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Now, anyone of another nation is another way of saying anyone who is a Gentile, anyone who is non-Jewish, anyone who is a foreigner. Peter says it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit such people, which raises a question, what law? What law is in view here? Well, there is no scriptural uh, law prohibiting a Jew from associating or visiting with Gentiles. The law to which Peter alludes arose from Jewish religious tradition, not scripture. Now, this religious tradition may have been loosely connected to the God-given scriptural directive to not follow foreign gods, but avoiding all foreign gods is certainly not the same thing as avoiding all foreign people and considering them to be unclean. Through the vision, uh, God helps Peter to understand the distinction. In the last part of verse um, 28 in chapter 10, he explains, But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now, this is Peter saying that he should not be prejudiced. He should not be bigoted. He should not be racist. He should not discriminate on the basis of ethnicity. He should not call any person common or unclean. All men and women are equally sacred and equally valuable and therefore should be afforded equal rights and equal respect. How fitting an idea for uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day that we are going to observe on Monday. I wish I could say... I had planned it that way, but I didn't. This is groundbreaking. The the story of Cornelius and Peter ushers in a new era in which God wants the doors of Christianity and the church to be kicked wide open, to be inclusive of 
all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. And that's the background for our text today, which begins in Acts chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. News travels fast. Peter travels from where he met Cornelius in Caesarea to Jerusalem. And we don't know whether Peter set out immediately or whether he accepted uh, Cornelius' invitation to remain for some days in Acts 10.48. But we do know the most direct route from Caesarea to Jerusalem would have taken a couple of days. Regardless, news travels faster than Peter does. The Jewish believers in Jerusalem had already heard about what happened with Cornelius and his family when Peter arrives. And so, of course, they celebrate, right? Wrong. Verses 2 and 3 present a very different response. So, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. The circumcision party almost sounds like a political group, but it's not. It simply describes Jewish believers who are circumcised. A a painfully literal translation of the original Greek phrase is simply the ones from circumcision, and they are not excited about the conversion of Cornelius. They are offended by the apparent transgression of Peter in breaking the law against hanging out with Gentiles. And so they don't congratulate Peter, they criticize him. The original Greek word translated criticized is telling, it is diakrino. Now Luke, the author of Acts, uses this word diakrino only four times, all of them in connection with this particular account. And the word basically means to discriminate, to separate, to make a distinction. And it's translated in various ways depending on the nature of the distinction in view. For example, Paul uses the same word a little later in verse 12 in connection with the Gentile envoys sent by Peter, uh, sent by Cornelius for Peter. Peter says, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Now, the Spirit told Peter not to discriminate, diacrino, against the Gentile envoys. He commanded Peter not to dismiss them or to treat them prejudicially, diacrino, just because they are Gentiles. And so back here in verse 2, when the very same word diacrino is used to say the Jews criticized Peter, The implication is that the Jews are engaging in the same kind of discrimination that the Spirit prohibits. They are discriminating against Peter for his failure to discriminate against the Gentiles. And when they say, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them, it's not just a statement of fact. It's an indictment that comes with an implied and incredulous question. Peter, how could you? That the Jewish believers in the Jerusalem church are willing to criticize Peter shows that this perceived transgression is considered to be a major offense. Think of it for a minute. The the Jewish Christians in the Jerusalem church um, are willing to call on the carpet the acknowledged leader of the Christian movement at that time. Peter is effectively the, uh, the then CEO of Christianity who has been at the forefront of preaching and performing miracles. 
The Christians in the church are entrenched in their religious tradition of ethnic discrimination, and they are now enraged by their leader's failure to uphold their um, discriminatory tradition. The hardliners in the circumcision party likely viewed Peter as fraternizing with the enemy, as tearing down the traditions that made Israel great, as, as burning the national flag. Verses 4 through 17 constitute Peter's defense. As I read it, I want you to notice that Peter's primary defense is to simply recount his own experience and to show what happened is God's work consistent with God's word. Verse 4 begins, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. Now, to say that this happened three times suggests that Peter himself repeatedly objected to what God was trying to tell him. And this establishes some common ground with uh, his brothers who are criticizing him. In effect, Peter is saying, initially, I objected to the idea too. And Peter is not virtue signaling here. He's confessing his own prejudice. He's owning his own bias. He's saying that he was wrong, stubbornly wrong. He admits it um, took three swings by God himself to crack his coconut. Peter is willing to own his own stuff and to change. This kind of humble acknowledgement of one's own wrongheadedness and wrongdoing is courageous and rare. Peter could have spun this. He could have managed the details of the story in a way that was not so self-incriminating, maybe omit the three times part or, or downplay his uh, own objections to God's way or, or try to rationalize. I, I was just trying to be a patriot because I love the nation of Israel. But he doesn't. He doesn't spin it. He just spills it. Unvarnished, unretouched, unadorned. I was wrong, period. How refreshing. Peter continues in verse 11. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. Now, Peter does not give the details of what he said to those gathered with Cornelius. His words are recorded for us back in Acts 10. Peter's emphasis here is on the fact that the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles in the very same way he had fallen on the Jewish disciples at Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2 at the very beginning of the church on earth. And then Peter provides 
some new information in verse 16, saying, And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter is trying to ex- um, uh, tying his experience to the word of God. He's hearkening back to a time when he and the other disciples were with the crucified and risen Jesus in Jerusalem just before his ascension to heaven. And it was then that Jesus said the words Peter is quoting here in verse 16. They're recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, uh, consistent with the word of the Lord, the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit shortly thereafter. And now Peter is saying that Cornelius and his family experienced the exact same thing upon believing in Jesus. The Lord has saved the Gentiles in exactly the same way as he saved the Jews. There's no distinction, no prejudice, no discrimination. And then Peter concludes his defense in verse 17, saying, If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Peter is saying that it would have been wrong for him to allow his prejudices to stand in God's way. Peter is admitting that his prejudices need to be cleared away in deference to God's purposes. Peter's uh, courageous stand helps his brothers and sisters see things differently. Verse 18 says, When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And so remarkably, the Jewish believers in the church in Jerusalem walk back their objections. They recognize this is from God. They stop criticizing Peter and they start glorifying God. New life in Jesus is available to Gentiles too and to anyone to everyone who will simply believe in Jesus. Of course, that didn't end all uh, prejudice and discrimination. We'll see uh, more of it later in the book of Acts, but it was a monumental step in the right direction. And so, here's the big idea I draw from this text. Don't let your prejudices stand in God's way. Don't let your prejudices stand in God's way. That's another way of saying, be willing to own your wrongheadedness and change as Peter did. Now, the specific prejudice in view in our text is an ethnic bias against Gentiles. But that certainly is not the only prejudice that can get in God's way. We can harbor all manner of prejudices that can get in the way of bringing the life of Jesus to our world. Ethnic prejudice, political prejudice, sexual prejudice, religious prejudice, gender prejudice, socioeconomic prejudice— It's all looking down your nose at someone different than you. And it goes uh, way beyond disagreement to denigration and, and harboring disdain. And there seems to be an awful lot of that going around these days. And some things in our culture seem to foster it. For example... 
There's so many different and competing sources of news and information and opinions today. It can be overwhelming and confusing. In an effort to, to cope somehow with the complexity, it is so easy to, to pick and stick with one or two sources that feed my bias, that feed my preferences, that stroke my traditions and my prejudices. And increasingly, it seems that the sources of information on all sides are less and less focused on simply reporting uh, facts and ideas and nuances and more and more focused on trashing people who are different. Any fisherman knows the kind of fish you catch is largely determined by where you choose to fish. A part of me wants to say, hey, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not wrong-headed. But I wonder if that in itself is just another form of prejudice, the thinking that I'm better than that. I'm better than all those people who struggle with prejudice and wrongheadedness. I'm better than Peter. And perhaps this is the worst kind of prejudice because you can't change what you don't acknowledge. I'm afraid I'm no better than Peter. In fact, I could learn from his example. Let me just mention a handful of ways that I think we can follow Peter's lead in applying this idea, don't let your prejudices stand in God's way. First, ask God to show you and be receptive. Peter may not have come to realize his own hindering prejudice had he not been prayerfully receptive to God. You may recall from our study in chapter 10 last week that both Peter and Cornelius received their guidance from God surrounding the issue of ethnic prejudice in the moment of prayer. And the suggestion is that we would do well to regularly adopt a habit of receptive prayer, like David in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, who says um, prayerfully, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Be open to the possibility that you are in some way wrong-headed. Invite God to bring to your attention any prejudices that may be lurking. Second, weigh changes in light of God's word. Peter evaluated the change he was being called to make in light of the word of God, not the traditions and opinions of people. Peter's primary authority was communication from God. He received the vision from God, then he correlated that with other communication from God, namely what Jesus himself said, recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Sometimes we can fall into traditions and preferences that seem so pious, but in reality, they have no basis in Scripture. And such traditions can become obstacles to the gospel. Consider such traditions as uh, only a certain kind of music should be played in church, or only a certain version of the Bible should be used, or only a certain kind of preaching is legitimate, or uh, only members of a certain political party are good and godly people, or only in-person gatherings count as church, not online gatherings. These traditions should be weighed 
and challenged in light of Scripture. Third, own your stuff and be willing to change. Peter humbly owned his own prejudice and he was willing to change his mind and his behavior to align with God's design and purposes. In the midst of all our political turmoil and wrangling in America, there seems to be a glaring absence of anyone anywhere saying, you know, I think I was wrong, and I think I need to change. It's as if we think that this would somehow be an unacceptable show of weakness. But owning our stuff is anything but weak. It is one of the most courageous things we can do. Fourth, expect opposition and be patient. Peter faced opposition from his own people when he took a stand, but um, he was patient with them. When we stand up and say something like, I think I have been wrong about this, I think I need to change, and maybe we all do, don't expect everybody to applaud. I'm afraid pushback in the face of change is the norm. Nobody likes to face their own prejudices. Nobody likes to make hard changes. And some will throw leaders under the bus who break with tradition and call for change. That's what the Jewish Christians and the Jerusalem church did to Peter. How easy it would have been for Peter to respond to such opposition in anger and vindictiveness. After all, Peter was the leader of the early church, handpicked by Jesus. And Peter had just heard from God himself, how dare these people call him on the carpet? But Peter did not respond with rancor. He patiently recounted his story. He vulnerably confessed his weakness, and he humbly pointed to God's word as his authority. Fifth, expect change to be a process. Prejudice is not binary. It is a continuum. Peter's vision from God and his encounter with Cornelius was certainly a turning point that got him moving in the right direction, but it was not the end of his struggle with prejudice. We're going to see that there were ongoing tensions in the early church between Jews and Gentiles. Prejudices did not suddenly and completely uh, go away. To be sure, the text presents a bright spot and a turning point in history. But the change was and is a process, and sometimes that process is slow and fitful. Later in Peter's ministry... In a weak moment, he himself um, separated himself from Gentiles and pandered to the ongoing prejudice of the circumcision party. And the Apostle Paul had to confront Peter on his hypocrisy. You can read all about it in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. I'm actually encouraged by this, not because I want others to struggle, but because I struggle. This lets me know that I'm not alone. There is hope. Peter was not perfect. He was a work in progress, and so are we. By God's grace, Peter was still able to bring the life of Jesus to the world. And so are we. Don't let your prejudices stand in the way of God. Let's pray.
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any prejudice that stands in your way. Amen.